Thank you, Russell. I'm very pleased, no thrilled, this morning to welcome the Honorable Twyla Gross, representing the province of Nova Scotia. The Honorable Minister holds two significant portfolios. She is the Minister of the Public Service Commission and the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Please welcome the Honorable Twyla Gross. Greetings all and welcome everyone. On behalf of the province of Nova Scotia, I extend heartfelt gratitude for the invitation to address you today at the president's opening breakfast of the 2023 Universities Studying Slavery Conference. Before I again, be began, I would like to acknowledge also that the land upon which we work, live and gather is Mi'kma'ki, the tr traditional territory and ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. Our relationship is based on a series of sacred and his historic peace and friendship treaties. We pay our respect to the Mi'kmaq people and recognize in this province of Nova Scotia that we are all treaty people. This conference is not just an academic exercise. It is a powerful acknowledgement of the resilience, the contributions and triumphs of black people and communities across the Black Atlantic world, including here in Canada and Nova Scotia. It's a celebration also of the strength and determination of individuals who, in the face of systemic adversity, have made invaluable contributions to our society. In a distinct context from the land acknowledgement, I would like to recognize also the existence of people of African descent in Nova Scotia for more than 400 years. May we honor and offer gratitude to the ancestors who came before us to this land and our commitment to not let history be lost. History is why we are here and we are also here to address the urgent calls made by some organizations such as the Black Lives Matter, Matter movement for universities to redress anti-black racism, foster black inclusion and create environments where black individuals can truly flourish. Universities have a vital role in this endeavor in educating us. And also it is heartening to see all the progress that some institutions have made in response to these calls. Shattering barriers and champion representation in government is in paramount to amplifying the narratives, experiences and challenges faced by our communities, both locally and on a broader scale. As we embark on the 10th year of the Provincial Government Action Plan, count us in. Nova Scotians Action Plan for People of African Descent from 2015 to 2024, we are actively ex exploring innovative avenues to ensure not just inclusion, but an unwavering commitment from our government to bolster our communities. It is one of my priorities as Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs to continue department, to partner with other departments to invest in community organizations and educational initiatives crucial to the success of this action plan. And we need you, each and every one of you, 
and all the work you do every day at home and in our communities that creates a surge of change for the greater community as a whole. In closing, I want to express my deep gratitude to all of you for your dedication and unwavering commitment to this important cause, to this conference. Your work is crucial, and it is through collaboration and continued dialogue that we will make lasting progress. It is through conferences and organizations like these where we can come together to champion each other. Together, let us embark on this journey towards more equitable and an inclusive future. I leave you with a quote from Portia White, a beloved and famous African Nova Scotia singer and enter entertainer who broke many barriers during her time. She said this, first you dream, then you lace up your boots. Thank you, and I wish you all a very productive and impactful conference. Thank you, Mr. Gross. With the formalities now passed, please enjoy your belated breakfast. <laughs> and after a brief repast, uh, we shall have uh, the main event. Thank you.
It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a deeper understanding of everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye-opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they've built a thriving community here, well respected um, in politics and business and um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world and we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana, you know, must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China, they've tried to mass produce it, but you will never get an authentic Kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly, especially um, when you get it from uh, the Kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see Kente here. Uh, representing the African club and I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this club. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana happens to be the country that has the most forts and castles in Africa and from many of those forts and castles which began um, a trade in gold and other you know, uh, legitimate goods. Uh, slavery overtook all these and became more profitable than even the trade in gold. And so all these forts and castles were converted into slave forts. And a lot of the slaves that were captured from the landlocked areas, from Burkina Faso, from Mali and others, uh, came to a place called Salaga, which was where the auction took place. And then after they had been uh, sorted out, they were marched to the coast uh, into the slave forts. And for those who have gone back to Africa and gone to especially the Cape Coast castle, we have two big castles, Elmina and Cape Coast, which were quite notorious for the slave trade. We have the famous door of no return, where most of our ancestors you know, went through before they were loaded onto the ships and shipped out to the colonies in the Caribbean, America and other places. And so there's always been that intrinsic link between the two. And it's always important to trace the journey from the origin to the destination. And I think that this for me locks in part of what happened on the other side. I was just looking at the migrations and re-migrations back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And as a student of history, I uh, did history for my first degree. I think that this has been a very enlightening experience. And so I want to thank you all very much. Thank King's College. 
thank the Black Caucus Center, and I hope that this cooperation is going to uh, enhance the understanding of what happened in our history. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax but I get a deeper understanding of everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they built a thriving community here, well respected. Um, in politics and business and um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world and we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana you know, must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China, they've tried to mass produce it, but you will never get an authentic kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly, especially um, when you get it from uh, the kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see kente here uh, representing the African cloth. And I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this cloth. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana happens to be the country that has the most forts and castles in Africa and from many of those forts and castles which began um, a trade in gold and other you know, uh, legitimate goods. Uh, slavery overtook all these and became more profitable than even the trade in gold. And so all these forts and castles were converted into slave forts. And a lot of the slaves that were captured from the landlocked areas, from Burkina Faso, from Mali and others, uh, came to a place called Salaga, which was where the auction took place. And then after they had been uh, sorted out, they were marched to the coast 
uh, into the slave forts. And for those who have gone back to Africa and gone to especially the Cape Coast Castle, we have two big castles, Elmina and Cape Coast, which were quite notorious for the slave trade. We have the famous door of no return, where most of our ancestors you know, went through before they were loaded onto the ships and shipped out to the colonies in the Caribbean, South America and other places. And so there's always been that intrinsic link between the two. And it's always important to trace the journey from the origin to the destination. And I think that this for me locks in part of what happened on the other side. I was just looking at the migrations and re-migrations back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And as a student of history, I uh, did history for my first degree. I think that this has been a very enlightening experience. And so I want to thank you all very much. Thank King's College, thank the Black Caucus Center, and I hope that this cooperation is going to uh, enhance the understanding of what happened in our history. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a deeper understanding of everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye-opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they built a thriving community here, well respected, um, in politics and business and um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world and we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana you know, must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China, they've tried to mass produce it, but you'll never get an authentic kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly, especially um, when you get it from uh, the kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see kente here uh, representing the African cloth. And I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this club. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history 
of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana happens to be the country that has the most forts and castles in Africa. And from many of those forts and castles which began um, a trade in gold and other, you know, uh, legitimate goods, uh, slavery overtook all these and became more profitable than even the trade in gold. And so all these forts and castles were converted into slave forts. And a lot of the slaves that were captured from the landlocked areas, from Burkina Faso, from Mali and others, uh, came to a place called Salaga, which was where the auction took place. And then after they had been uh, sorted out, they were marched to the coast uh, into the slave forts. And for those who have gone back to Africa and gone to especially the Cape Coast castle, we have two big castles, Elmina and Cape Coast, which were quite notorious for the slave trade. We have the famous Door of No Return, where most of our ancestors you know, went through before they were loaded onto the ships and shipped out to the colonies in the Caribbean, America and other places. And so there's always been that intrinsic link between the two. And it's always important to trace the journey from the origin to the destination. And I think that this for me locks in part of what happened on the other side. I was just looking at the migrations and re-migrations back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And as a student of history, I uh, did history for my first degree. I think that this has been a very enlightening experience. And so I want to thank you all very much. Thank King's College, thank the Black Caucus Center, and I hope that this cooperation is going to uh, enhance the understanding of what happened in our history. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a deeper understanding of everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye-opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they built a thriving community here, well respected, um, in politics and business and um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world and we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana 
you know, must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China, they've tried to mass produce it, but you will never get an authentic kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly, especially um, when you get it from uh, the kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see kente here uh, representing the African cloth. And I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this cloth. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana happens to be the country that has the most forts and castles in Africa and from many of those forts and castles which began um, a trade in gold and other you know, uh, legitimate goods. Uh, slavery overtook all these and became more profitable than even the trade in gold. And so all these forts and castles were converted into slave forts. And a lot of the slaves that were captured from the landlocked areas, from Burkina Faso, from Mali and others, uh, came to a place called Salaga, which was where the auction took place. And then after they had been uh, sorted out, they were marched to the coast uh, into the slave forts. And for those who have gone back to Africa and gone to especially the Cape Coast castle, we have two big castles, Elmina and Cape Coast, which were quite notorious for the slave trade. We have the famous door of no return, where most of our ancestors you know, went through before they were loaded onto the ships and shipped out to the colonies in the Caribbean, America and other places. And so there's always been that intrinsic link between the two. And it's always important to trace the journey from the origin to the destination. And I think that this for me locks in part of what happened on the other side. I was just looking at the migrations and re-migrations back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And as a student of history, I I did history for my first degree. I think that this has been a very enlightening experience. And so I want to thank you all very much. Thank King's College, thank the Black Caucus Center, and I hope that this cooperation is going to uh, enhance the understanding of what happened in our history. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a deeper understanding of everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye-opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica 
because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they built a thriving community here, well respected um, in politics and business and um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world and we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana you know must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China they've tried to mass produce it but you will never get an authentic Kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly especially um, when you get it from uh, the Kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see Kente here uh, representing the African cloth and I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this cloth. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana happens to be the country that has the most forts and castles in Africa and from many of those forts and castles which began um, a trade in gold and other you know, uh, legitimate goods. Uh, slavery overtook all these and became more profitable than even the trade in gold. And so all these forts and castles were converted into slave forts. And a lot of the slaves that were captured from the landlocked areas, from Burkina Faso, from Mali and others, uh, came to a place called Salaga, which was where the auction took place and then after they had been uh, sorted out they were marched to the coast uh, into the slave forts and for those who have gone back to Africa and gone to especially the Cape Coast castle we have two big castles Elmina and Cape Coast which were quite notorious for the slave trade we have the famous door of no return where most of our ancestors you know went through before they were loaded onto the ships and shipped out to the colonies in the Caribbean, America and other places. And so there's always been that intrinsic link between the two. And it's always important to trace the journey from the origin to the destination. And I think that this for me locks in part of what happened on the other side. I was just looking at the migrations and re-migrations back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And as a student of history, I uh, did history for my first degree. I think that this has been a very enlightening experience. And so I want to thank you all very much. Thank King's College, thank the Black Caucus Center, and I hope that this cooperation is going to uh, enhance the understanding of what happened in our history. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of 
the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a deeper understanding of everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye-opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they built a thriving community here, well respected um, in politics and business and um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world and we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana you know must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China they've tried to mass produce it but you will never get an authentic kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly especially um, when you get it from uh, the kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see kente here uh, representing the African cloth and I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this cloth. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a deeper understanding She was Nova Scotia's first female ombudsperson, person, one of the first black paralegals in Manhattan, the first woman to serve as assistant deputy minister in the Ontario Women's Directorate, the first African Nova Scotian CEO of the province's Human Rights Commission, and the first human rights advisor at Dalhousie University. Mayan began her employment. Thank you. Mayan began her employment with Dalhousie as the first employment equity officer. She was the first senior administrator hired to assist uh, faculties and administrative units with planning and implementing programs of employment equity. Mayan was appointed by Dalhousie as first distinguished public service fellow with the Faculty of Management School of Public Administration. And before I call her forward, it's important to note, and I, uh, it's not in the notes here, but many of us 
who hold that $10 bill with Viola Desmond on it will know that Mayan was instrumental in getting Nova Scotia to posthumously pardon Viola Desmond uh, uh, for, um, for challenging racial segregation that existed not only in the, uh, in the New Glasgow Roseland Theatre, but in Nova Scotia as a whole, right? And, And now I call to the stage uh, Honorable Dr. Mayan Francis, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Did you enjoy your breakfast? I'm so happy to be up here to introduce this speaker because. What's so interesting in my life is that I did travel to Ghana. I was sent to Ghana in 1986. On a, I was sent there by the um, Public Administration of Canada. And it was a, a women's conference. And I gave my speech. And the women were all from Africa. Maybe one or two were not. Every single one of them had a PhD. And this was in 1996, and I have to, yeah. Uh, I was so deeply moved by them, too, because um, I was deeply moved by Africa as all of that, because I visited um, a slavery place, and my life changed, um, especially getting the story about what happened to the women. And all the women um, at the end of the conference circled me, squeezed me, and said, you belong to us. You will always be with us. And that's where my heart. And i doing some downsizing in my history, giving a lot of it away. And I discovered my album that I had pictures of me in Ghana. I brought it to him this morning. He's keeping it. The album is so moving, he recognized some people in there. <laughs> and he said, and that's you there too. And I said, yeah. So I'm happy the, that you're taking it, because then that be part of your history as well. Thank you. I am pleased to have the honor of introducing the Excellency John Damani Mahama. His Excellency was the fourth president of the Fourth Republic of Ghana, from 2013 to 2017, and Vice President of Ghana from 2009 to 2012. Under His Excellency, Ghana witnessed a massive infrastructure development drive in all sectors of the economy, including education, health, ports and harbors, and aviation, rail, oil, and gas, ICT, and many, many more. His vision and strategic investments in these areas have solidly positioned the country for its next phase of development as a lower middle income country. His Excellency's presidency is also notable for its advancement of social justice and equity, including his promotion of girls and women's interest at all levels. So that's why I was so happy to give him the album that I found. During his administration, Ghana attained gender parity in basic education. He also in, ensured the appointment of many women to high positions in his administration. His Excellency is a former chairperson of the Economic Community of West African States Commission and a first co-chair of the United Nations Advocacy Group on a sustainable development goals. He is currently the chairperson of the TANA Forum, a high-level forum on security in Africa, headquartered in Ethiopia, in recognition 
of his contributions on the African continent and around the globe as a leader and a model. His Excellency has been conferred with a number of honorary doctoral degrees from distinguished universities across Africa and Europe. He has written for several newspapers and authored a number of publications, including his first book, a memoir entitled My First Coup d'Etat. I think I said that right, it's French. And other, <laughs> and other true stories from the lost decades of Africa. So please welcome His Excellency John Mahama. Thank you, good morning. I guess it's the best time to speak after a good breakfast. <laughs> um, let me not make the mistakes uh, Isaac made in the acknowledgments. <laughs> I'll acknowledge just a few people and then I'll stand on the protocols that he established. And so Mian, of course, is sitting right next to me. And she told you about the album she gave me of her visit to our country, Ghana. And um, she visited the slave castle in Elmina. And um, she had beautiful pictures of it. Um, Kim, thanks uh, for uh, the time we spent in your office, receiving us in your office. Um, Russell, thank you for yesterday and walking us through the Black Cultural Center. Uh, William, thanks, we were there together at the Black Cultural Center. And uh, Theresa, who's been my guide and chaperone since I, I came, thank you very much. And um, if yeah, if we, you know, who has been in and out uh, since we arrived, and um, I hope I'm not forgetting uh, anybody else. Our High Commissioner to Canada, Ambassador Soma, and indeed all the many friends that we've made in the few days that we've been uh, here. I'll just go straight to my speech, and um, I'll say that I'm honored to be here today at this conference with such a fascinating and esteemed group of participants and attendees. I arrived two days ago from Ghana. I traveled by air over a route that an untold number of slave ships with their human cargo packed tightly like spoons have sailed again and again and again. When flying over the Atlantic Ocean, regardless of the time of day, the flight attendants will dim the cabin lights and lower the window blinds. Because of this, I never think to look out of the window. It never occurs to me that I'm being transported over the middle passage, which is perhaps the largest graveyard of formerly enslaved people in the world. During the three plus centuries of the transatlantic slave trade, more than 12.5 million once free African men, women, and children were carried from their homelands as enslaved people to islands in the Caribbean and countries in the Americas. On every voyage, roughly 10 to 20 percent of the people being transported did not make it. They died from disease or abuse and their bodies were thrown overboard. Or they decided that death would be preferable to whatever fate lay ahead of them. And so they jumped overboard. 
My speech today was meant to focus on loss. I wanted to speak of the unimaginable loss of human resources that the continent of Africa has suffered because of the transatlantic slave trade. Every developing nation knows that regardless of how much gold or oil or timber or cocoa or any other natural resources you might have, its citizens are in fact its best resource. Think of the loss that the African continent suffered as its warriors, its farmers, its hunters, its carpenters, its jewelry makers, tailors, griots, seamstresses, chiefs, doctors and other healers, architects, artists, philosophers, etc., were lined up with shackles and chains at their ankles and wrists, then boarded onto slave ships and carried across the waters where they were forced to use all of those skills that they possessed to build another nation, to build several other nations, none of them on the African continent. That's the irony, isn't it? When the Western world uses the words like poor and developing to describe African nations, when they try to make Africans feel inferior, meanwhile, people of African descent have served as the economic and cultural backbone of nearly all Western nations. Meanwhile, people who made some of the greatest inventions of the Western world are of African descent. I had planned in my speech today to quantify the loss, specifically in financial terms. From the arrival in North America of the first slave ship in the 1600s until the lowering of the colonial flag on African soil in 1919 has primarily been financial, primarily profit-making. What and how many natural resources to extract? Then to how to use those resources for economic gain. Sugar plantations, cotton fields, construction, cooking, cleaning. All these required steady hands to pick, pack, plant, chop, stir, scrub, hammer, and nail. Within the diaspora, how do we begin to calculate the financial cost of slavery to settle on a single number for reparations? How do we begin to do the same on the African continent? These are serious questions. Because the damage done by the institutions of slavery and colonialism are still echoing through the daily lives of most black people across the globe. In North America, it can be seen in the violent, sometimes deadly policing and discriminatory housing and employment policies. In Africa, it can be seen in the infrastructural deficits, the need for more schools, hospitals, affordable housing, and better roads. It can be seen in the inability of most Africans to read and write in their native languages, despite being able to read and write and speak in their colonial languages. From the continent and throughout the diaspora, the resounding damage of slavery and colonialism are most painfully evident in the displacement of our people we're always migrating north or south, or emigrating to Europe or North America. We're being either forcibly removed from our homes or moving voluntarily with nothing more than the hope of a better life elsewhere, even though we still love our homelands and wish we could stay. 
A prime example of site displacement would be the community of Afriqueville, The government neglected to provide the Afriqueville community with basic services, despite several petitions by the residents, and they allowed the community to fall into disrepair. The area immediately surrounding Afriqueville was used for industrial purposes, and a waste facility was even situated near the residences, a classic case of environmental racism. One after the other, people of Afriqueville fell ill and the community was forcibly relocated to homes in another part of town because the government deemed that the area was a health hazard. Then the site where Afriqueville had once existed in disrepair as a slum underwent a revitalization that resulted in the construction of a bridge, port facilities, and new roads. The attention, time, and financial investment that was not given to Afriqueville was suddenly somehow available. Though it took nearly five decades, I understand that the city of Halifax issued an apology. I understand that it also began the process of reparation for the families and individuals who were affected by the forced removals and demolitions of one of the first communities of free black people in North America. I hope this inspires more cities throughout the diaspora to issue apologies and offer reparations for the wrongs done to the numerous black communities that have been stolen away, burned, drowned, leveled, or otherwise somehow destroyed. On the African continent, every time a young person packs a small sack and walks beyond the borders of his or her country and continues north to brave the Sahara Desert to cross over into Europe, it's an example of a voluntary migration. And those types of departures are usually born out of desperation, poverty, hunger, war, limited opportunities, and climate crises such as floods, fires, and drought. Warsan Shire, a Kenyan-born Somali prof poet, was raised in the UK and now lives in the US, wrote in her poem titled Home. And I read, No one spends days and nights in the stomach of a truck, feeding on newspapers, unless the miles traveled mean something more than journey. No one crawls under fences. No one wants to be beaten or pitied. While traveling here on the airplane, I was thinking of all these things, loss, the financial impact of loss, and how to calculate reparations in such a way that they not only acknowledge past suffering, but also take into account the current social inequities that exist as a direct result of slavery's legacies. For some reason, neither I nor the flight attendant had lowered the shade on the small window by my seat. I pressed my forehead to the window and stared through the clouds down into the ocean below. And I thought of the people who had fallen ill on those slave ships and had their dead or nearly dead bodies thrown overboard. I thought too of those who had escaped the clutches of their overseers and ran quickly barefoot to the top deck and then jumped overboard. Who were they? From what town or village had they been forcibly taken? Ghana, my country, has more slave forts, fortresses, and castles than any other country in the world. The once free African men and women and children would be led in shackles and chains from Salaga in the northern part of Ghana down to the Asen Manso ancestral slave river site, 
where they were giving their final bath. I said man, so where the river was. Also, there's also the site of a market where people who had been captured were bought, were brought to be sold and purchased. I suppose this would be a good place to stop and address the question and concerns many black people in the diaspora have about whether Africans sold other Africans, <coughs> their own people into slavery. To the best of my knowledge, this was not a universal, universally acceptable practice. Nevertheless, the monetary inducement by the white slave traders created bands of opportunistic locals who raided villages for the sole purpose of capturing people to sell. So some Africans did sell others, even after it had become clear that slavery in the Western world was not an indentured servitude or practice of serfdom, but a very brutal institution. There's an African-American saying I recently learned that fits perfectly in this discussion. Not all skin folk are kin folk. <laughs> that was true then, and it's true even now. On the plane looking down into the Atlantic Ocean, I wondered about the people for whom that was their final resting place. I wondered about the relatives and friends who had been waiting for them to return home. The mothers and fathers who went to their graves with an aching in their souls, knowing what had happened to their sons and daughters who had simply disappeared. Or worse, knowing their sons and daughters had been captured and fearing the unknown fate that had befallen them. Whenever black people from the diaspora come to Ghana, they visit the Cape Coast Castle or the Elmina Castle. The Cape Coast Castle is one of two fortresses in which captured Africans were held before being transported to one of the numerous nations that were engaged in the business of chattel slavery. Visitors to Cape Coast Castle are giving a detailed tour of the facilities. They are taking into the dungeons where the once free men, women and children were held without food, a bathroom or lights. <coughs> the floors and walls of the dungeon are uneven, rough and bumpy in some places. And that's because over the centuries, the many layers of excrement, blood, bones that were left there have petrified and become a part of the structure. During the tour of the Cape Coast Castle, visitors also walked the path that the newly enslaved individuals, always, always with shackles and chains at their wrists and ankles, were taken to be loaded with the other cargo onto ships. The door that leads from the fortress to the outside is named the door of no return. Standing at the threshold of that door is an astonishing experience. All that is visible is the sea and the sky. As they stretch out, the blue above and the blue below meeting only at the horizon. You can imagine and think about the terror that must have consumed these African men, women, and children. Even I, comfortably seated in a plane in the sky, looking at that endless stretch of blue below, could remember the terror I had seen in so many tourist eyes as the door of no return was swung open. Those eyes, as they lingered on, those blues, sea and sky, understood that this is what our ancestors saw. Our ancestors who just days, weeks, months before, had been in their communities, had been loved, had been productive, had been proud. They had been home and they had been free. The award-winning and celebrated Canadian writer, A.C. Edujan, is of Ghanaian descent, 
She was the 2013 featured speaker for the Henry Chrysler Memorial Lecture Series, which is the flagship event of Canadian, the Canadian Literature Center. Edujan's lecture, which centered on a visit she made to her ancestral homeland of Ghana, was published as a book titled Dreaming of Elsewhere, Observations on Whom. And she writes, all our stories are about whom. It is our beginning and our ending. And because our stories, our life, and our lives are not only what we have done and will do, but also what we might have done. The idea of home includes, as it must, both departures and arrivals, and every farewell carries the promise of a return. One of the many essential and defining things that was taken from the once free African men and women and children who were enslaved was land. The knowledge of a homeland, that is not an insignificant thing. The removal of land from a people and people from their land is one form of erasure. Because land is memory, it is a legacy, it is culture, it is a source of nourishment. Land is liberation. Just look at the world, look at the nations, be they in the Middle East, Eastern Europe or Central and East Africa that are currently at war over territory, over land. Allow me to pause here and acknowledge that we're standing, standing on the ancestral and unceded land of the first nation, Mi'kmaq, I hope I got it right, Mi'kmaq. And if any of you are in attendance, Weli Esibug, Weli Esibug, in Cape Coast Castle, that exit, the door of no return, which symbolized such a painful departure, has now been transformed into an entrance as well. People of African descent from all over the diaspora come to Ghana, specifically to enter through that door, which from that side of the building is now named the door of return. They enter the door and enter the Cape Coast Castle as free people. They walk through the halls where ancestors were held captive, and then they exit onto the streets of Ghana. It is more than a symbolic gesture. It is a spiritual reclamation. The government of Ghana, where so many enslaved people passed through the door of no return, understood this and wanted it also to be a practical reclamation for those who were interested. And so starting in the year 2000, Ghana passed an immigration act that paved the road to residence and eventual citizenship for all people of African descent who like to settle. And it's called the right of abode law. My speech today, as I mentioned, was meant to focus on laws. And indeed it has done that, though not in the way I had originally imagined. It is important for me to stress that some losses can never be repaired, repaid or replaced. And the loss of human life is one such loss. For all the souls who perish, it is a loss not just to Africa, but to all of humanity. And as A.C. Edujan wrote, our lives are not only what we have done and will do, but also what we might have done. What might these our ancestors have done? What inventions and discoveries might they have made? What art, what music and literature might they have composed? The pain of that loss has been handed down to us. The children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of those who witnessed the misery of the days spent in those dungeons, who witnessed their relatives and friends die or leap overboard 
in the transition across the Middle Passage. The people of African descent in the diaspora were born with that pain and it sometimes haunts them like a ghost limb. The pain of that loss was also felt by the ones who remained. Mothers and fathers who never saw their children again. The children whose parents were carried away in chains. The siblings who were separated by a vast ocean. We, the Africans who were colonized and oppressed on our own land, were born with that pain, and it sometimes haunts us as well. This is the very definition of generational trauma. The wounds inherited through epigenetics. Today we still listen to speeches and engage in discussions about the myriad injuries of slavery, about the way that racism and anti-blackness are perpetrated in education from primary school to the academy and about the systems and societal mechanisms that, ins that institutionalize this inequity. We will discuss and listen to talks of reparation as you listen and receive all the information that will be presented, I would like us to remember these three things. One, the work of atonement done by somebody else for the injustices of the past should not be confused with the work of healing that must be done by us for the well-being and joy of our posterity. And two, we are the answer to our ancestors' prayers. They survived the unspeakable so that we would be free to soar beyond the limits that society, family, friends, and even our own fears try to place on us. And finally, three, there's a home for you in Ghana, and we'll happily welcome you back home. As one of our own, through the door of return whenever you are ready. My brother, the High Commissioner, is here, and I'm sure you can get more information on the right of abode for persons of African diaspora from our High Commission here in Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel deeply honored to, re to have received the invitation to speak to you today, and I'm grateful for your kind attention. Thank you. And now we will have <clears throat> Matthew Martell, the Executive Director of the Black Business Initiative. I uh, give thanks for what was a remarkable speech uh, by uh, uh, the Honorable His Excellency jo uh, John Mahama. Matthew is not only the Executive Director of the Black Business Initiative, but he's also a Dalhousie alum, alumnus, as well as a former student of mine. So it's a great pleasure, honor, uh, to actually have him here. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, everyone. And, uh, you know, extremely, extremely inspiring words. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. So I, I, you know, I was given very short two minutes to, to thank, you know, the whole group here. And I know we're a bit behind time, so I'll be extremely quick and say um, thank you to the sponsors for today's event. Thank you for the organizers, the musicians. Thank you so much to Wayne on the libation ceremony. Uh, and thanks to the musicians, thanks to the, the singers as well. Um, also, I, I want to thank Isaac. I know uh, you took some hits today, and I'm not a morning person either, so uh, I, I know how tough it is uh, to be up here. So, you know, you did a great job today, of course. Um, and then finally, big thank you to uh, His Excellency. Um, you know, extremely, extremely important remarks on loss uh, and, and impactful to me. Uh, you know, my, my father from Ghana and my family still back in Ghana. So it really, really wonderful to be in your presence and to hear your remarks. It's been, it's been amazing for me. Um, 
And, and I also want to thank you for being so accessible to the community in your time here. Um, you know, I know we're having a great session tomorrow morning uh, where we'll talk about youth entrepreneurship and engagement uh, and, and really, you know, the opportunity for everyone in this room uh, to be here with the dignitaries and the High Commissioner, I think, um, you know, is, is extremely, extremely amazing and you've been so generous with your time. So on behalf of all the partners here, again, thank you so much uh, and we look forward to the other sessions as well. Thanks. And uh, 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 thank you. Uh, this concludes this session formally. But in about 50 minutes or so, we begin the concurrent panel sessions. And uh, I know for some of you, uh, and just like me, we don't like scanning the code on the, uh, the back of the program. Uh, some of us would have preferred to actually have had some trees perhaps provide themselves to us uh, with a paper program. But we're going to put up, obviously, on the slides here uh, where the sessions are, right? So you can see which ones you would like to go to, right? Uh, we actually have a con uh, talking about reparations. Uh, we actually have a session that will be dealing with the politics of reparations. And I'd like to make a point that we also have amongst us uh, some of the key people who are driving uh, reparations in the context of the Caribbean community. Uh, it's not just simply ideas. It's been translated into a political, uh, meaningful, central reality, right? Uh, some of you probably have seen the promises that have been, and the concessions, and the apologies that have been made from various Western European governments. Even King Charles II is now formally looking into the transatlantic slave trade by opening the archives, even though the royal family's hands are all over it, right? And so I'd like to acknowledge uh, David Commission, who is here, uh, who has been an unsung hero behind the scenes of the reparations movement in the Caribbean, as well as Sakaya Thomas, who is the head of the International Committee of the Global African Congress, who was central to that as well. So look at the... Uh, You'll see the sessions, the places uh, where, the, the, where the sessions are, and I look forward to all the exciting presentations and discussions that we will have. Thank you. So, before you all depart, sessions are downstairs and there will be signs pointing you to the rooms okay so the sessions are downstairs look for the signs pointing to the rooms thank you Everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye-opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they built a thriving community here, well respected, um, in politics, in business, and um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world. And we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana you know, must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China, they've tried to mass produce it, but you will never get an authentic kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly, especially 
um, when you get it from uh, the Kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see Kente here uh, representing the African club. And I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this club. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana happens to be the country that has the most forts and castles in Africa and from many of those forts and castles which began um, a trade in gold and other you know, uh, legitimate goods. Uh, slavery overtook all these and became more profitable than even the trade in gold. And so all these forts and castles were converted into slave forts. And a lot of the slaves that were captured from the landlocked areas, from Burkina Faso, from Mali and others, uh, came to a place called Salaga, which was where the auction took place. And then after they had been uh, sorted out, they were marched to the coast uh, into the slave forts. And for those who have gone back to Africa and gone to especially the Cape Coast castle, we have two big castles, Elmina and Cape Coast, which were quite notorious for the slave trade. We have the famous door of no return, where most of our ancestors you know, went through before they were loaded onto the ships and shipped out to the colonies in the Caribbean, America and other places. And so there's always been that intrinsic link between the two. And it's always important to trace the journey from the origin to the destination. And I think that this for me locks in part of what happened on the other side. I was just looking at the migrations and re-migrations back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And as a student of history, I uh, did history for my first degree. I think that this has been a very enlightening experience. And so I want to thank you all very much. Thank King's College, thank the Black Caucus Centre, and I hope that this cooperation is going to uh, enhance the understanding of what happened in our history. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a deeper understanding of everything, seeing the role that the black people played in building this community and the patriotism that they displayed during the First World War, Second World War, and also the discrimination and racism that they faced. This is an eye-opener and um, I'm glad that I was able to come to the Black Cultural Center. Um, if you look at the migratory routes, some of them were sent here from Jamaica because they had rebelled against British colonialism and they were called the Maroons and so some of them settled here in Halifax. Others were brought from America because they wanted freedom and slavery was still 
um, prevalent in America until the American Civil War took place. So some migrated to Halifax and they built a thriving community here, well respected um, in politics and business. And um, I think that the resilience of the black community here is an example to Africans everywhere in the diaspora. Kente has become the symbol of um, the African wherever he finds himself in the world. And we must be very proud of our Kente cloth. Um, the fact that it is still woven in several parts of Ghana, you know, must be something that we continue to preserve. I know that in places like China, they've tried to mass produce it. But you will never get an authentic kente cloth unless it is woven uh, properly, especially um, when you get it from uh, the kente weavers in, in Ghana. So I'm proud to see kente here uh, representing the African cloth. And I think that all blacks and Africans everywhere in the world identify with this cloth. to be here and to compliment all of you for the great achievement you've made in establishing the history of Africans in the diaspora. I think there's an intrinsic link between the two. Ghana happens to be the country that has the most forts and castles in Africa and from many of those forts and castles which began um, a trade in gold and other you know, uh, legitimate goods. Uh, slavery overtook all these and became more profitable than even the trade in gold. And so all these forts and castles were converted into slave forts. And a lot of the slaves that were captured from the landlocked areas, from Burkina Faso, from Mali and others, uh, came to a place called Salaga, which was where the auction took place. And then after they had been uh, sorted out, they were marched to the coast uh, into the slave forts. And for those who have gone back to Africa and gone to especially the Cape Coast castle, we have two big castles, Elmina and Cape Coast, which were quite notorious for the slave trade. We have the famous door of no return, where most of our ancestors you know, went through before they were loaded onto the ships and shipped out to the colonies in the Caribbean, America and other places. And so there's always been that intrinsic link between the two. And it's always important to trace the journey from the origin to the destination. And I think that this for me locks in part of what happened on the other side. I was just looking at the migrations and re-migrations back to Africa and Sierra Leone. And as a student of history, I I did history for my first degree. I think that this has been a very enlightening experience. And so I want to thank you all very much. Thank King's College, thank the Black Caucus Center, and I hope that this cooperation is going to uh, enhance the understanding of what happened in our history. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting exhibition. It um, tells the story of the black communities in Halifax. Um, we've studied geography and in O-level and A-level geography, we studied the 
North American continent and I had known about Halifax, but I get a 